today is John Williams. He's the founder and publisher of ShadowStats.com. He received an AB in economics at, uh, and cum laude uh, from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Dartmouth Amos Tuck School of Business Administration. And he was also named an Edward Tuck Scholar. And the thing is that he's been around for a while. He's been an economist for 33 years. He's worked with individuals as well as Fortune 500 companies. And he has a great uh, site that we call ShadowStats.com. We'll have a link for that on the website. John, how are you? Uh, fine, thanks, Andrew. Uh, th thank you for having me on your show. So I had some questions for you. We we oftentimes uh, reference some of the materials that you have on your site, and uh, I thought we would just start with um, a quick explanation from you on, you know, what it is that you're doing on the site, what stats you're bringing up, and maybe then we'll get into how you derive some of those statistics. Sure. Well, as you noted, I've been doing this for uh, several decades. I found early on that... Um, I had any hope of uh, providing meaningful economic forecasts for my clients, and, and my clients generally are, 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 are private. Um, I have uh, I really had to understand the nature of the government statistics, what was being reported, what was not being reported. I found over time that the uh, what was coming out with the popular numbers, such as the uh, employment data, inflation data, the GDP data. Economic numbers tended to um, be stronger and, and, and seem to be getting stronger over time against what the, uh, the, the common experience was, and that the inflation numbers uh, were, were turning uh, softer than, than, than common experience. As I got into the detail, um, indeed, I found there were being, uh, changes being made to methodologies, generally very open changes. All you have to do is read the footnotes in the, in the reports. And um, with the effect of uh, putting upside biases into the economic statistics and downside biases into the uh, inflation numbers. The changes were deliberate. So what I did was uh, try to uh, back out the gimmicks that were being put in and uh, report the numbers on, a, on the uh, same basis as they were reporting them, net of, net of the gimmicks, uh, along the lines of, uh, of common experience. What I found over time is that uh, Main Street USA has got a pretty good sense of what's going on. It's not just the, um, the, the, the you, you may have all sorts of hype. You may have uh, occasionally, um, and not, not only rigged uh, uh, statistics like an occasional real upside boost to GDP that's not there, um, but where the GDP is consistently overstated, the average guy doesn't believe that. He, 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 he knows how business is going in his community. And it's uh, Main Street USA's uh, approach and understanding of where reality lies. It's basically what, what do you experience? What do you see out there? And um, that's what Mr. Trump picked up on, that the economy was not as strong as it was being advertised. And he hit home with that hard. And um, that, that, I think, was a key factor in his um, overthrowing the uh, uh, system as it had been up to that point in time. Uh, he, he recognized the problem, and there are a lot of people that responded to his uh, recognition of such. Now, so who, what is the purpose of, if, if you're telling me that many of the numbers that are presented are done so in a way and have been, well, we use the word manipulated, I guess, in a way to make it look better than it is, right? Is that, that's what you're saying? Generally, yes. Okay, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? Uh, generally, uh, to um, uh, prop up uh, administrations uh, uh, politically. If you go back to the days of Lyndon Johnson, and um, uh, I, I know people or knew people who worked in the Commerce Department at the time, uh, he would review the, uh, the GDP numbers, or what were then the, the gross national product, the GNP numbers, He'd review them uh, regularly. If he didn't like them, he'd uh, he'd send them back to the Commerce Department. He'd keep sending them back until the Commerce Department got them right. Uh, <laughs> I, I kid you not. This is, there have been manipulations over time, generally around politically sensitive times. On the other side of the aisle, if you go to the uh, first Bush administration and the recession in um, uh, 1990, 91, uh, there was... Uh, there were people in the administration who moved to 
uh, manipulate that GDP number. They boosted the GDP reporting outside the system. They, they, it was done in the private sector with reporting to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. I knew people on all sides of it who were involved and have confirmed it a number of times. The effect was that the the GDP was artificially boosted. The recession was called to an early end. Uh, but guess what? Main Street USA didn't buy it. And uh, Bill Clinton touted, oh, it's the economy, stupid. Main hmm. Street USA picked yeah. up on that, yeah. and they, they, they didn't uh, vote for um, – they, 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 they voted uh, Bush out of, uh, out of, out office. of office. But, but uh, Clinton <clears> – <throat> excuse me. I mean, you've had all these, this wonderful hype that we, the economy recovered uh, from its uh, collapse into uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2007. It never happened. Uh, I mean, I tracked the underlying numbers, uh, and you not only have political uh, gain for uh, incumbent uh, politicians, but the, the numbers are also used for games being played by the Federal Reserve. And... Um, <clears throat> Again, a lot of people just looking at the real world know the economy hasn't been quite good, that good. Now, granted, you'll have pockets of relative strength and weakness around the the, the country. It's not it, it's it's not uniform. But if you look at the uh, GDP, for example, the official version of the economy is that uh, it peaked in uh, late in 2000, collapsed into 2009, and then rebounded, and it's now 11 percent, 12 percent above where it was. Um, at its pre-recession high uh, back in uh, in 2007, that's adjusted for inflation. Now, th- uh, that's not common experience. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, which we can, which we can get into. But I, I just give you as, a, as an example, um, employment, mm-hmm. also a number that's very heavily inflated um, on the upside or the unemployment that's uh, a rate that's deflated on the on the downside. Um, employment is uh, is is up maybe five percent um, over its pre-recession uh, peak. It's not up eleven percent, twelve percent. Industrial production is below its pre-recession high right now by almost two percent. Uh, industrial production accounts for over sixty percent of the uh, of the GDP. The manufacturing sector never never recovered its uh, pre-recession high. It's down by uh, about six percentage points. Uh, you look at the uh, housing industry. Uh, off its pre-recession high, depending on the series that you look at, you're down uh, 20 to uh, 60 percent. Uh, again, never having recovered, uh, recovered a pre-recession high. Um, the, 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 the GDP numbers are a lot of fluff. They have very little meaning. And they had an amazing spike in the third quarter, which... Uh, Gives the current administration a happy exit, but guess what? The 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 reporting of the fourth quarter GDP, which is going to come in um, probably at a fairly uh, reduced rate of uh, growth initially, maybe turning negative in its ultimate uh, version. Um, it get, doesn't get published until um, a week after the inauguration. So what, what, one, of the, one of the things that I don't understand is if if let's just say that we are looking at this whole situation that there is the um, as you say, that there's a lot of, of, of question as to how this is all constructed and it's really meant to look better and GDP really isn't a lot better. But yet we're seeing a lot more housing sales. I mean, that, I don't know how we can really mess with that number too much. Um, we're seeing that housing prices have gone up. We're seeing that um, yes. there are supposedly – we'll just, just hold, this, hold your breath as I say this – supposedly more people working. Um, there are earnings that are better in corporations. We're seeing that, generally speaking, car sales are up dramatically. And again, there's reasons why that may be and some uh, uh, initiatives that have been made. But, but if, if we were to look at just your unemployment data numbers, uh, and I want to focus on this chart for a second here, we'll look at the official numbers, the broadest measure, the U6, um, and the quote-unquote shadow stats numbers and the alternative. Now, if I look at this chart, it very simply shows me that really we have had zero recovery. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it, it may have even gotten slightly worse since 2008. Is that a fair statement? Well, you we have you have had uh, some recovery. The thing is, what you have had is uh, uh, companies cut back to the bone, and uh, uh, so that you had uh, you, you you had some uh, uh, layoffs that. Uh, removed a little bit of uh, fat from the system. 
Um, but generally, uh, we, we've not recovered much. My contention is that where, where the headline numbers, the, the economy uh, collapsed into 2007 and rebounded, um, my, my contention is the economy collapsed into 2007. Um, you, you had some recovery, but it's basically been uh, flat and stagnant. Now it's turning down again. And um, you, you see that, for example, in industrial production. The uh, industrial production, again, 60% of GDP, um, uh, had a brief peak in uh, December of 2014, almost like it was just a one-month peak where it went above uh, its pre-recession high, and then it's been downhill since. Mm. You've seen year-to-year -year declines there. Now, for more than more than a year, you've never gone for more than two quarters of year-to-year -year decline in production in the 100-year history of the series where you've not been in a formal recession. Uh, now, you mentioned a number of factors there. Keep in mind, when you look at the numbers against the pre-recession levels, you're still well down. I mean, housing sales, uh, new home sales, for example, still is down uh, order of magnitude 20% from where it was at, at its pre-recession high. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you get ups and downs and uh, all sorts of spikes in the current numbers, and, and they get revised lower. Uh, you look at uh, the year-end uh, you know, auto sales, yep, there was a big jump, and you had all sorts of uh, incentives. We haven't seen the seasonally adjusted uh, data work through in the retail sales yet. Uh, but I can tell you that if you look at uh, uh, consumer production, uh, you're, you're, you're looking at a – and uh, this is – the consumer goods, which includes the autos, um, it is uh, you, you see the sharp fall up and basically uh, stagnant uh, bottom bouncing since. Mm -hmm. uh, there are any number of ways you can look at the numbers and, and cherry pick the the, the 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 good details. Of course, yeah, of course. Um, but the, uh, the the numbers that we're seeing uh, on whole on aggregate are, are generally uh, and, and not as uh, not not as advertised. And Wall, Wall Street's a is a very big proponent of putting out the good numbers. You say, who wants those good numbers? Um, there's a, a popular um, a financial network on television um, where I uh, went on. I was predicting in a, a, a recession at the end of 89, which is about when it started, although it was clocked, I think, in 1990. Um, I was predicting that, and I wasn't hearing anyone else talk about it. But they, they had me on the air to uh, make my uh, case. Um, but as is their nature, they also had on someone to give a counterpoint. And they brought in a, an economist from a very large New York City bank. The two of us sat and talked in advance uh, about what our views were. I outlined my, outlined my case for the recession. Uh, his response was, well, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's fair. I, I think that's a consensus outlook. I was shocked. I, I hadn't heard anyone else talking about it. We went on the air. I gave my pitch on why we're heading into recession. He said, oh, we're going to have a booming economy in the year ahead. <laughs> and um, there's a reason for that. He had, he had to put forth a story that met the needs of his employer. Wall Street has a general bias in terms of putting out good news that helps them sell, sell product. And most of the economic consensus, uh, most of the guys you see quoted in the press are Economists put up by their Wall Street by Wall Street just to do that. So let me make. Um, let me make I, it, let I don't. Me. I don't sell. Go ahead. I, 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 I don't sell consensus. I give people the the best estimate I can give. And, and let me tell you something. Out. The other thing is, I would I would venture to say that I'm just I'm just speculating here that he was invited back a lot more times than you were. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> what can I? What can I tell you? Listen, on the other side, they, well, they knew what they were getting with me. They they, they knew what I was for. Right. Now, and, and they did. They, 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 those times have become a little less frequent. Um, well, as the circumstances have gotten difficult here. Right. We Again, know how that goes. Let me ask you something I'm also sorry? about unemployment. I want to talk about the unemployment rate for a second. Your yes. your, your shadow yes. stats. There is a question. Um, I have um, someone who follows you, and he, 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 we do another show called DH Unplugged. He asked me a question to ask you, two questions, actually. Um, uh -huh. Have you noticed that the official unemployment rate and the shadow stats uh, unemployment rate had a – for for a long time, they were – well, while there was a difference, clearly a difference and a spread, they kind of worked, you know, pretty well together, right? You know, the ups yeah. and the downs and the basic gyrations right. and all that. Ever yep. since Obama came into office, there has been a massive separation. And the question right. is, why is that? 
Well, first of all, Obama came into office uh, as the economy was collapsing. It already uh, he he uh, was elected at the end of eight uh, two thousand eight. He came in early two thousand nine, which was before the trough and recession. But the employment numbers tend to lag the economy a little bit, and uh, so the I mean the the the, the, the employment is just falling apart there. What hap- what's happened in this most recent cycle? In, in this extraordinary economic downturn that's different from the past uh, is something that is highlighted by changes that were made to the reporting methodologies uh, of the uh, unemployment rate back in uh, 1994. Back in 1994, you're looking at the onset of NAFTA. Uh, people in the government were expecting that you'd have a fair number of people displaced as, mm-hmm. as uh, production moved into Mexico and such. Uh, production from small towns where maybe you're not going to get full uh, replacement of the of the, of the jobs and um, so they, they change the definitions one of them is an area called discouraged workers the headline unemployment rate the one that uh, gets reported in all the press each month in order to be counted as unemployed there you have to have been actively looking for work in the last four weeks uh, obviously wanting a job if you've not looked for work in the last four weeks, they don't count you as unemployed. If it's if you've looked for work in the last year, and you 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 you, you still want to work, they will uh, they'll count you as what they call a discouraged worker, and they put you in a broader unemployment measure. So the the headline number, the, what they call the U3, they have six measures. U3 is a headline number. Um, you're counted there as unemployed if you haven't looked for if you've as long as you've worked for looked for work in the last four weeks. Now, the unemployment rate simply is calculated as the percent of unemployed versus the uh, labor force. Labor force, very simply, is the number of people who are employed plus the number of people who are unemployed. So if you become a discouraged worker in the headline number, you're no longer uh, counted as headline unemployed. You're moved into the U6 number, as they call it. Um, And if you look at the U6 number, that got up to about 17 18%. And then, then came back down. It's now at about 10%, where the the uh, headline uh, U3 numbers uh, down a little bit below 5% at the moment. Um, what happened there, and the reason the U6 number came down, was that you had a um, uh, people uh, there are now only counted as um, um, unemployed so long as they haven't been discouraged for more than a year. If they've been discouraged for more than a year, they're just excluded from the headline unemployment numbers. Before the changes in 1994, it didn't make any difference how long uh, you'd been as a it seems discouraged to me if you're not, worker. It, it seems to me if you're not working, you're not working. I'm now, sorry? It seems to me if you're not working, you're not working. You know. That's right. And if you want a job, that's, that's the way I look at it. I, what I've done is I've tried to reconstruct – uh, what we'd be seeing had they done things the way they did before the 1994 revisions. Again, it's all a matter of definition. But in estimating the uh, displaced workers, and these are my numbers, and I base it on the history of the numbers over time, a lot of uh, surveying that's been done here, uh, I've got an unemployment rate that's just shy of 23%. And I'll contend that if you went around the country and asked everyone whether or not he or she was uh, unemployed, you'd come up with a number close to that. I've had people come and say to me, look, that's uh, oh, we, we, so like levels we had in the Great Depression, 25% supposedly was the peak unemployment there. Well, back in the Great Depression, there's over 20% of the uh, uh, pe- people working were on farms. And uh, today that's less than 2%. A, a more appropriate comparison perhaps is the non-farm unemployment rate to get up to 35% in the Great Depression. We're not, we're not there. Um, it's as bad as we've had since the Great Depression a little worse than uh, 1970, mid-70s downturn and the early 80s downturn. But in terms of your question as to why the divergence here, uh, what's unique in terms of modern experience is that you're not seeing the unemployment rate plunge because people are finding jobs. That's the happy circumstance. That's what happens in a normal economic cycle. Um, People become unemployed. The unemployment rate rises. um, They go back to work the unemployment rate declines. That's the happy circumstance. 
Um, but when you count, when, when you calculate the unemployment rate, you can also have the unemployment rate decline because um, the headline unemployed, are, instead of finding jobs, are being defined out of existence. They're no longer be count, being counted in the labor force, the headline labor force. And a lot of that has happened because people have not gotten jobs, but rather have become discouraged. So that when you look at the, at the divergence there, uh, you have the discouraged workers going from the U3 number, which is the old, you know, it's nice, nice and low, uh, into the uh, U6 measure, the broader that includes the people who have been discouraged for less than a year. That's around 10%. But once they, after a year, they, they drop out of that as well. Uh, my number picks them all up, and I'm, I'm up over uh, over 20%. So that's my estimate. And I'm so what I'm pick, doing is picking up all these discouraged workers that have disappeared from the system, and it's the drop in the number of discouraged workers more so than people gaining new employment that mm-hmm. has resulted in the drop in the headline unemployment rate. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that going on there. Let me ask you this. Um, what do you respond to uh, of, of maybe some critics of yours? Because I've seen some things about this that people say, oh, he uses fudge factors to get to those numbers. What, what is your response to that? Uh, I don't use fudge factors. Ah, that's what I thought you were going to say. I, I mean, it's my, so they're, 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 they're my estimates. It seems to me, John, that you're, what you're trying to do is strip out all the nonsense, strip out all the the – the uh, manipulative ways of showing the data and really just presenting the data. Would that be a fair estimate or a fair uh, thing to say about what your, what your, your numbers portray? Yes. With the, with the following caveat, again, it's, it's definitional. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to put it back in the, in the forum that in the way it used to be reported and defined the way that uh, people experienced it, uh, where the numbers were more credible, it reflected common experience. I'm trying to come up with numbers that are consistent with common experience. And, and I'll contend that if you survey people, in fact, there are a number of surveys that show this, the average guy thinks the economy is worse than being reported and that inflation is higher than being reported. Um, and that is, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to come up with estimates that are consistent with a common, common experience, um, which I'll contend is largely... Uh, a matter of uh, redefinition of the series away from common experience, in in the into the realm of the politically beneficial. Mm-hmm. So let's let's kind of skip ahead real quickly to uh, an analysis that you wrote on the at the end of the year, December thirtieth, the uh, shadow government statistics. It's a commentary that you write, and um, you talk about this an interesting situation here, that there is the potential for a resurgence. Um, and the pressure on the Fed to expand their uh, quantitative easing program, which they're saying pretty much, well, you know, what we're really concerned about the inflationary pressures that we're going to see with some of the fiscal policies that may be legislated by the incoming administration. But what you're seeing is that uh, the potential for a big sell-off in the U.S. dollar um, and some long-range concerns about the solvency of the U.S. Treasury. Right. So that, well, that flies in the face with a lot of what everybody's all cheery about right now, which is oh, stocks are up. GDP came in at yeah. a good print. We saw that the ISM manufacturing and the ISM non-manufacturing numbers came in good. The unemployment rate is low. The Fed says, hey, things are getting a lot better. Trump is going to come in with fiscal this, fiscal that, tax breaks, repatriation of assets, uh, you know, U.S.-centric policies, and all the things that right now are being – looked at as very much uh, significantly beneficial to the U.S. economy, not to mention stocks. What the Fed tells you usually is nonsense. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 they, have no, they have no real interest. I, I mean, it would be nice that the economy was um, moving along and uh, inflation was contained and everything was uh, happy as it was perhaps at one time. Uh, they'll tell you that their mission is to um, have uh, maintain uh, positive economic growth, uh, contained inflation. Those are their those are their primary directives from Congress. The primary mission of the Fed is to keep the banking system solvent. They're the central bank. Uh, there's very little they can do at the moment to stimulate the economy. They know that Bernanke's expressed that commonly. They can create any inflation any time that they want to. All they have to do is uh, debase the dollar. 
um, <clears throat> and that will spike inflation it, because uh, oil prices will rise. Uh, oil prices uh, have an inverse relationship there. The dollar weakens, oil prices rise, gasoline prices rise, and oh my goodness, all of a sudden we've got uh, higher inflation. The, the upside and the downside to inflation in recent years has been driven uh, about 90% by the movement in gasoline prices. Um, the Fed can move at any time that it wants. So to say, oh, we're trying to get the inflation rate up to 2%, that's, that's, that's nonsense. They could do that any time. Uh, their problem is that the banking system collapsed in, effectively in, in the panic of 2008. Uh, the, the Fed, the Treasury, made a very clear decision. I'm not saying I wouldn't have done the same thing. I'll contend we shouldn't have been in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. But they decided to do any, anything and everything necessary to prevent the banking system from collapse. Uh, they uh, bailed out whatever was needed. They guaranteed whatever funds were needed. They bought companies. Uh, everything possible to do. Uh, whatever, irrespective of cost, the problem is all the measures that they took to keep the system afloat, and they did keep the system afloat, um, were stopgap measures. They didn't do anything to address the underlying problems that had, had led us there. And right now we still have a banking system that is uh, not operating normally, not lending normally. Uh, their fear is that the economy, uh, weak economy, stresses the banking system, stresses the Solvency of the bank, banking system, more loans go bad. Um, <clears throat> so they, 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 they talk about a strong economy being important here. It is from the standpoint of keeping the banking system solvent, but there's very little they can do themselves to stimulate the economy. The whole bit about the quantitative easing was never designed to stimulate the economy. Uh, what they did was they bought a tremendous amount of uh, treasuries and, and mortgage-backed securities from the banking system, flooded the banking system with liquidity, but they had the, the banks uh, redeposit the funds with the Fed as extra reserves where the Fed paid them interest. Uh, had they allowed the banks to uh, redeposit, uh, put those any of that uh, uh, new liquidity into the uh, economy in the way of loans, uh, you would have seen some growth in the money supply and, some, and indeed some stimulation of economic activity. But they didn't do that. The concern has been and, and still remains um, the, the, the the banking system and keeping it afloat. And it's not working. The banking system is still not afloat. Well, I'm and, and not that, mention, that just and that, but that's the hope with all the, the, the potential for deregulation in theory. Um, and, but but I, I agree with you that the Fed, I think there has been some noticeable change. I think it's been very noticeable that there has been a change in the overall confidence. Now, you have algorithms uh, trading on the Fed numbers and you have all this going on. Yeah. You know, but, but I think, personally, I think the tipping point was... The fact that, one, the Fed, which I think we agree with, is terrible at forecasting. They were forecasting four rate hikes last year. They did one, and with all sorts of excuses in between. But the second thing that I think was really very telling was not necessarily here in the U.S., but when Japan and Europe went to a negative rate on, mm -hmm. on, on, um, on, their, on, their, on, their, on their, uh, their Fed funds rate, if you will, um, and how that backfired on them so severely – Yes. Um, I think there was a realization that, wait a minute, these guys really don't necessarily know what they're doing. <laughs> they're just playing around, toying around to see how things go, pushing and pulling buttons. And like, what does this do? Oh, if, hey, if I pull this string, what does that do? And I think the agreement is that if – I think people do agree that yeah, there's been a lot of debasing of the currency going on. There had been with the uh, quantitative easing. And we did have them at record low interest rates. And if, in fact – there wasn't the ability for them to spike inflation at this point. When can they actually, you know, and and, and meet their goals and to, you know, increase everything uh, on a GDP basis and all that? When is it going to ever happen? And that's when the the realization that all the shenanigans that the bank that the uh, that the uh, companies are doing pulling with the you know lending out uh, and, and right now we have more debt outstanding than ever on a corporate basis. And, you know, what they do with that debt? Well, they turned around and bought their own shares back. Why? Is it the best company in the world? No, because they can increase their earnings and all things. So there's a lot yeah. of shenanigans being played, right? Well, guess what? The shenanigans, again, go back to the Fed. Because what, 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 what I'd like to get through is a point here. I didn't quite get it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the Fed, what they, what they did 
with a quantitative easing was to bail out the banks. Now, what they used as the excuse was, oh, uh, we're stimulating the economy. The economy's weak, therefore, we're, we're, we're putting forth this quantitative easing. The, the weak economy provided them political cover because the average consumer wasn't looking to bail out the banking system. What they're doing was bailing out the banking system. Now, the economy is turning down again. Uh, you're seeing some, you're going to see some weak numbers in the next uh, couple of months. And uh, in fact, as we're, we're talking, you've seen a, a down day on the, uh, uh, the, the, the currency mid speculation that maybe the Fed's not going to be quite as uh, uh, active again in uh, raising rates. The whole reason they didn't raise rates last year, they, they were jawboning it, trying to keep the dollar up at the same time. Um, they, they, they wanted to keep the, uh, the, the system as it was. It's still not stable. But if the economy uh, continues to tank which it's doing and what they're, they're seeing, they need to move back towards quantitative easing. because uh, It's not because they're looking to stimulate the economy. They're looking to provide some liquidity to the banking system that's going to be under increasing stress. And uh, guess what? Uh, you also get uh, uh, stress under the, for, for the uh, uh, Treasury and its, and its funding needs. Uh, right now, we've, our, the people used to be buying bonds outside the United States are generally selling them. Um, Fed funding needs are going to rise here as the deficit does, and a weak economy widens the deficit. Um, so that the what what the Fed accomplished with its quantitative easing was not economic stimulus; it was to provide liquidity to the banking system. But in the process, and buying up all those treasuries, and they're still holding. $2.5 trillion worth of treasuries. They haven't ended quantitative easing. They just stopped active purchasing. They're maintaining that level of $2.5 trillion treasuries. And when they get paid interest by the, uh, the treasury, it, it pays uh, the Fed pays the interest back to the government. They effectively monetized those treasuries, which at the time in which it purchased it was about three quarters of uh, the, the new treasury issuance of the treasury. Uh, the treasury is going to need some funding help here um, and then that'll be uh, be another reason for going back into the quantitative easing to help the banks, to help the treasury, despite and 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 in fact, uh, actually because of uh, the much weaker than expected economy, we're not seeing an economic recovery, and that's where the reality is. That's why, why Trump is in office. You're going to see this increasingly with with the uh, headline data, um, with the employment data. The employment numbers are rigged very heavily with upside biases, but the uh, the numbers ahead are generally going to be weaker than expected. The Fed is, is going to find itself having to move back into quantitative easing and as opposed to further rate hikes, and uh, that's what is going to hit the dollar. And it'll hit the dollar hard and um, will tend to spike domestic inflation, um, which are the Fed supposedly has been rooting for, but then they're going to get inflation beyond um, 2%. And um, that, that starts to have all sorts of negative effects in the uh, in the markets. Gold will be nice in those circumstances, um, and you're going to end up with a real inflation problem. Yeah. My, my, certainly, my views are not uh, not commonplace. Well, I, I got to tell you though that I think that we we've been actually um, for the last uh, few months uh, on the back on the gold train. You okay. know, we're not gold bugs by any any. As a matter of fact, I probably would be. Uh, if, if you say, are you neutral? Are you positive? Are you negative? I'm probably just a little left of neutral towards towards the negative side of gold. Uh, just generally mm -hmm. speak, generally speaking, you know, I'm not a lover of it. I'm not a hater of it necessarily. But you know, it's if it's time, it's time. Doesn't matter. Let's make some money on something, right? Um, well, I'm I'm looking at it not just to make money on. That's um, I look at gold as a as a hedge in terms of preserving the purchasing power of the uh, assets in it over time. It's the best inflation hedge that you have. And uh, the inflation gets real bad here, which I think it will. It's the type of thing that'll uh, save, save you the uh, value of your assets more than anything else. It's, it's uh, liquid, it's portable. I'm talking about holding physical gold. Mm -hmm. I can see things that are gonna be disruptive to the system here. I'm, I'm, I'm real. Is this the first time you said this? I tried to be realistic. I know I'm, I sound real happy here, but yeah. <laughs> Does this <laughs> is this the first time, or, or when did when did you get when did you get into this mode where you're seeing? Oh, I've been I've been uh, I've been looking at this. Uh, um, I've started warning about it after. Uh, oh, it was in uh, back in the uh, um, the second Bush administration when. Um, 
the Congress uh, did not uh, fund its uh, Medicare overhaul. It uh, set it up as unfunded liabilities. Right now, we've got unfunded liabilities. That present value, uh, it's an area that we you mentioned very briefly there, uh, puts us up into the uh, over $100 trillion. Uh, and that's effectively the cash you need in hand to cover it. That uh, includes not only unfunded liabilities, but the gross federal debt. And it's, uh, there's no way the government can cover that. Run it out over time. Um, if, it's, if it's not altered, you end up with uh, uh, the government having to either default on its debt, which it's not going to do, or as Alan Greenspan suggested, well, you just print the, the money that you need to pay your obligations, which gives you a hyperinflation. And um, there are ways of addressing it. But what you have to watch out for here is as we get into this uh, new system and we get some economic stimulus, it's going to you have a, a lead time there before it starts to boost the economy in uh, 2018. Uh, you're going to see some widening of the deficit. The global markets are going to start concentrating again on the, the U.S. deficit. And right now there's a serious long-term uh, uh, sovereign, sovereign solvency concern. Um, at the time, that's... Uh, and it was involved all the negotiations over the the, the budget deficit back in uh, 2011. But when Standard and Poor's downgraded the treasuries, you had a you had a dollar panic on your hands. All sorts of things were done to smooth that out. But the long-term solvency issues have to be have to be addressed. If if the new administration can address that and uh, do something to bring the uh, Fed's uh, uh, really uh, inconsistent or, or I don't know that would say it's inconsistent, but they, they don't know what to do. They, they they really are fighting a battle that they lost back in 2008. Uh, it's it's very difficult, not not an easy solution. But they, the 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 government has to do something um, cooperative there uh, to try and resolve that. They bring those issues under control, and at the same time, you have a little uh, stimulus going forward. Then you have the potential for a great boom. I just don't see the um, Either the Fed being uh, brought under control or the uh, uh, long-term solvency issues uh, being addressed in the near term. This is not. This, by the way, this is not only here. I mean, look at Europe. Europe is 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 a disaster. Look at Japan. It's the disaster. China, the debt loads they have. I mean, we've all fed on the same uh, set of information about not us. I'm talking about the central banks and the governments that just issue more debt, just quantitate, you know, just, just, just monetize the debt. Just, um, you know, don't worry about it. Just, you know, keep throwing money at the situation and make it look better and make the numbers look better. And I mean, it's really, it's a very, it's, it's a very dis, disconcerting situation. I mean, on one hand, you know, listen, as a, as a, as a money manager and as an individual with money and, you know, family and, and, and saving for the future and all that, um, you know, I say, well, well, we ride the wave when we ride the wave, whether it's up or down, doesn't matter. On the other hand, you kind of back off and look at this as a quote unquote citizen, as a just a person, an observer, part of, you know, the, the whole entire system. You got to say, you know, why, it, it, it's really kind of sad that it has to come to this, that there is so much, um, there, there, there's so much money spent so recklessly that has, you know, create a situation where essentially, you know, we're, we're a country that's just run on, on, on debt and just, you know, a, a, an empty checkbook. Yeah. Well, that's going to end. That's, that's the unfortunate thing. Um, I mean, you mentioned very appropriately how what great shape the rest of the world is. The United States is in the worst shape in terms of magnitude of anyone. And then you're looking at the world's dominant economy right now. It's the dominant currency. Um, and uh, we're not seeing strength in the currency that's commensurate with the risk in our system right now. You're going to see a sharp downside adjustment with the dollar, and when that happens, all sorts of um, uh, factors are going to start uh, piling up here, including including inflation. That's one reason the Fed has been trying to keep the dollar strong. If they wanted inflation, all they had to do was encourage a weaker dollar. Um, you, you, you've had all sorts of games going on here. Um, you go back to the uh, 2014 when the uh, dollar uh, starts to take off and uh, oil prices collapse. Uh, part of that, I believe, was orchestrated uh, uh, by the administration as an effort to uh, put financial stress on the Russians 
involved with the Ukraine circumstance. It, it's gone well beyond that. But the um, that's, that circumstance is now uh, sort of at its extreme. Uh, the low the low oil prices that came with that. Now you've got OPEC looking to uh, cut back and try and boost oil prices, which is laughable. But if the dollar sells yeah. off, they, they they don't have to worry about that. Uh, the, that'll that'll uh, spike the oil prices that'll right just away. Fix itself. Yeah, I'm sorry. That will fix itself. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're kind of out of time here. There's so much. Well, maybe we'll do this again soon because there's some great information here. Listen, we're going to put the information, some of these charts, on, um, so people can look at it. Links directly to shadowstats.com and how to get more information and become a member of John's um, John services. Um, but we'll uh, make sure to uh, have you back. This has been a fascinating, been a fa really, truly, I'm not kidding about this. It's been a fascinating discussion. And uh, I, I think a lot of my listeners have been, asking for you for a while so i'm glad we finally were able to get you on well thank you all right and now just to real quickly if they go to the website the shadowstats.com there's a lot of material there for non-subscribers background material on what's happening perfect we'll make sure to have the links there and we'll make sure to tweet it and do all sorts of fun things with it okay all right john thanks so much for being here thank you all right bye-bye take care